for being here. Um, we have some really interesting information that I want you to grasp. And uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is to make sure that everybody is on kind of like the same wavelength. We have space between you. If you can just come together. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So there's a phenomena that's known as morphic resonance. Morphic means body and resonance, as you know, or resonate means to move. And when individuals are linked by their hands or certain parts of their body, truly the energy moves from one body to the other and the energy begins to equilibrate. So that what one person is able to perceive and uh, understand immediately is transferred to the next person so everybody can get clearly what is being said. Does everybody have hands? Great. So I just want you to kind of just focus on making sure that you can feel the energy or the link connection to the person next to you. And just relax and uh, know that this information really is very old and ancient to you. But we're going to be waking up some genetic memory and giving you some information about uh, a wonderful new perspective as to how you can look at your uh, imbalances or illnesses if you have any. And uh, for those of you that have family members that are uh, perceiving themselves as being ill, that you can really get a clear understanding as to really what's happening to them. So how does everybody feel? Does everybody feel connected? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So why don't we sit down? So for those of you who uh, feel it comfortable to write, fine. But I prefer, how you doing? I prefer that um, you just kind of relax. I, the uh, flyer that was passed around the city has a lot of, uh, information that could be discussed on these very diseases, prostate disease and uterine fibroids and cancer and there was just a whole list of stuff. Um, and uh, one of the things that I knew about New York City many, many years ago, there used to be a man that, uh, uh, he's still here as I understand, a reverend uh, that used to broadcast in Omaha, Nebraska when I was in medical school. Uh, from here to Omaha and I used to listen to him when I had the time. His name was Reverend Ike, I'm sure some of you might have heard of him. You know, so. In regards to what your personal opinion might be, he used to say something very interesting, that he used to always say that he never allowed the uh, subject of his discussion to interfere with what he had to say. And so that's the takeoff that we're going to talk about today, because I want you to understand that all the things that are on the uh, flyer definitely have a common cause and have a common solution. So whether it's in males or females or whether we're looking at illnesses of children, uh, one of the things that I've discovered is, is that the lack of understanding of what really composes a human being is part of the problem as to why we don't understand what these disfigurements, these imbalances are in the body. Uh, I clearly understand that every experience that we have is an opportunity for us to grow and to learn more about ourselves and truly is an initiation into our God self. Now, Please pay close attention to what I'm saying, because when you look in the dictionary, if you look at what the di definition of a God is, it is actually a title that is bestowed upon a human being. It is not the proper title to give to that that creates all things known and, own and unknown to us. That's a, a totally different entity. And as a matter of fact, God essence or Godship is part of your destiny and part of your birthright. Uh, in the world of physics, there's been a tremendous amount of information that's been expressed mathematically to talk about the unlimitedness relative to the energies present in this dimension that we can absorb to transmute, to transcend, to become all kinds of things. But this energy, this light, literally, can only be assessed with proper consciousness or thought. There's something that we uh, are very concerned about in making sure that in our community, I'm talking about my own race family, that men and especially the women begin to understand that there are laws that govern this dimension. And irregardless of whether we are aware of them or not, we still are accountable and will always experience their effects. So when we are living in our own world and we do not understand these greater laws that sustain everything, we really usually are living in opposition to them and it is the stress, 
the resistance and the out of alignment with these laws that govern everything that are responsible for a lot of the discomfort, a lot of the perceptions of um, inadequacy, et cetera, that we have. There's nothing that comes to this dimension that does not already have a space in time created for it and has not been endowed with a divine gift and talent that based upon its mentality can allow it to be the most wealthiest person in this dimension or the poorest. So when we begin to interview people in my office where they really do not understand that they're here for a specific reason with a specific gifts and talents that are innate and natural that flow through them and that there are people waiting to give them whatever they might want for these talents. There are people waiting to supply them with the resources necessary to provide the talent, et cetera. And they really begin to feel that they're just out here on their own, that they have to compete. There's just a, a litany of very debilitating, uh, uh, how can I say, non-esteeming concepts immediately disease begins to enter into the vehicle of that individual. Now, let's get a clear understanding of what it is to be human. Most of us are still walking around thinking that having a physical body is what composes being a human being. That is a component of being a human. But the greatest attributes and the uh, seed immortality for being a human comes from the mental and emotional and soul bodies. Now, people walk around talking about spirituality, et cetera, but when we talk about this from an energetic level, and when we look at what the spirit is, it is actually a force that an individual creates for themselves based upon a particular type of lifestyle that involves interaction between the mental and emotional body. When we begin to sit and listen to people who come to us with diseases, uh, in their physical body, the first thing we begin to note is that these individuals have no rapport at all with their emotional body. They don't know what they feel. They don't allow themselves to feel. Or what they do feel, they recognize that they force their body to do something totally contradictory to that. When we are listening to their values and their belief systems, when we ask, why do you have this value? Why do you have this belief system? It isn't anything that they necessarily um, are truly rooted in wanting to believe for themselves on many instances. It is because of either inherited values and belief systems or assumed values and belief systems because of the numbers of people who are saying and doing the same thing that they just accept this as a norm. However, the bottom line is, is that when they recognize that what they espouse and what they believe on a mental level is totally in conflict to what they're doing on a emotional level, and then they force their body to do something totally different from the mental and emotional body, it is real. Now, how is it real? And this is finally what's coming to the forefront. There is a science known as psychoneuroimmunology, and this is something that uh, I'm very fascinated with and have decided to dedicate the rest of my life to, because very few of us are recognizing that the etheric aspects of ourselves, our emotions, our thoughts, become physical when the brain processes them. The mind and the brain are a total separate entity. The emotional body and the brain are a total separate entity. It is a factory, the brain, that is responsible for taking high vibratory frequencies, which are thoughts and feelings, and translate them, actually, transform them, I should say, into a chemical reality. That chemical reality is then released from the brain into the bloodstream, into the fluid that encompasses the spinal cord, the cerebral spinal fluid, so that every cell in your body knows what you are thinking. Every cell in your body chemically knows what to do then to create the corresponding feeling based upon the communication between the mental and emotional body. Now, I will say this once more because it is extremely important that you understand this. Your brain is, again, a tool, a factory that is responsible for making available to the cells of your body the information that is being radiated 
from the mind, which are thoughts, and also allowing you to experience the sensation that your thoughts provoke in your emotional body. So that means then that if you decide that you want to have a less than loving thought about a person or a situation, immediately you will notice that you immediately move into discomfort because by creating those kind of thoughts, the discomfort and the discordance that you create, the disharmony, immediately affects, first of all, the originator of the discordance. So can you imagine people who are walking around who have these opinions of many people who have these opinions of relationships that they've had in childhood, interactions that they've had in high school, situations that they might have had on the job, and they're talking about events that have happened 15, 20 years ago. This is a chronic excretion that is being made by your own brain every day, moment to moment, that is now released upon your cells of your body. The cells in your body now have to process this every day. So you really get a big boost or boost of this when there is a person or a reminder of the event that then really comes into play. Because as long as you have not come into a feeling of being comfortable with the experience, the subconscious or the right brain is constantly throwing off that same remnant of thought that is constantly stimulating the brain to produce the corresponding neurotransmitter. So if you just begin to understand what I've just said, you can understand why it is going to be impossible for the tissues to look like they did 15 years ago or 20 years ago, not just necessarily because of the quality of food that you're eating, not just because you might not be exercising, but because of the internal pollution that you are constantly creating of your own free will that destroys your own tissues. Now, see, you have to understand how profound that is because when we talk about immortality, when we talk about agelessness, when we talk about uh, infinite vitality, these things are real. It's already been proven. This is 94. In 1990, there was a German that received, uh, excuse me, a Russian that received the Nobel Prize for proving that mammalian tissue never ages as long as the internal and external environment remain constant. So you have to understand that, that that's awesome. So that means that if this is really true, this gentleman took a heart and kept it alive for 25 years. And the electrical current that was able to be carried by the muscles of the heart were exactly the same the first day he isolated and 25 years later. So the time period was not a factor at all as to the deterioration of this tissue. As long as he was able to make sure that there were proper nutrients on board and that the actual energy carried by the muscle did not deviate below a particular standard. So if this is something that can really happen in a test tube with all the other unknown phenomena that allows us to have energy by breathing, by being exposed to the natural environment, by actually being in the presence of other human beings that carry a higher frequency of energy, which always means that you'll be able to receive energy from them, then how can you explain the aging process, deterioration, illness, and death? It has to be something that is provoked from within. We find that the simpler people who uh, have been classified by certain cultures as being retarded or very simple in mindset, for whatever reason, they age very slowly, if aging at all. They basically maintain their vitality and are able to be, you know, uh, centurions without any effort at all, as opposed to the individuals who uh, feel that um, the lifestyle that they have is stressful, that they uh, feel that uh, they have to always watch their back, uh, they can't trust the people that they're around, you know, relationships don't work, et cetera. I mean, they're out of here by 60 years old. So I think it's very important to begin to understand that the diseases that we are now dealing with in the hospital institution originate from an internal, endogenous, as we say, source. And one of my uh, biggest concerns 
is the consistent resistance that the present hospital system uh, exhibits in wanting to look at the lifestyle and the values and the perceptions of individuals that come in complaining of disease. We have been able to identify many diseases that are truly invoked by states of consciousness, asthma, heart disease, narcolepsy, um, cancer as one of the main ones, arthritis. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on and on that we can identify a definite personality type that has particular belief systems, that have particular feelings that they actually emote or create that now exhibit uh, in the tissues and create these particular defects. There's a book that I acquired about two months ago that was a whole study that was done uh, by Harvard University that had two chapters on how disease was a learned behavior pattern. It's understood that illness is learned. It is not a natural concept and it's not a natural phenomena that human beings are supposed to experience. It is learned. The second chapter behind this chapter entitled Illness as a Learned Behavior Pattern was, are you teaching your children to be ill? Which was very, very interesting because then they began to elucidate how certain behavior patterns in the parents, certain communications, and also the exposure to information such as watching TV and recognizing that supposedly if you overeat, you're supposed to have an upset stomach and then you're supposed to take Tums, or if your nose is running, then that automatically means that you have a cold, so therefore you've got to have NyQuil or whatever else, and if your eyes seem to be stinging or whatever, then that's a problem. Now you have to have, you know, eye drops to put in it. All of these things are actually behavioral in teaching adults and especially children that X leads to Y. Okay, Y leads to Z. So therefore, it appears to them that this is a normal, acceptable behavior, even in the face of discomfort, that they are to accept. Now, I think that one of the things that is most uh, phenomenal is the fact that we still do not recognize that because the capacity to be here indefinitely, physical immortality is a reality, but it also requires, just like everything else, a state of consciousness and a lifestyle. And we have to accept that. It's just like anything else. If you're not willing to basically understand the technique to generate the phenomena, you can't have it. It's just that simple. So the idea to just assume that you don't have to do anything but just sit there like a bump on a log and you're going to be here for 200 years is inappropriate. So if the goal is that you want to be here 200 years, 500 years, 800 years, fine. That is truly a capacity that the body can give you without question. But to be able to do that requires, first of all, a consciousness, and then secondly, a lifestyle that allows the body to utilize its energy in the most efficient and effective way. So when we get involved in activities that are not efficient, that are not effective, obviously this is not a person who truly has long-term intent of being here for an indefinite amount of time. Well, what are those activities? And most of us are very much into a lifestyle that truly will not even allow us to live 70 years, less than 300. What could they be? The eating habits. Not necessarily even the quality of the food, it's just the timing that people eat is automatically suicidal. Depending upon the structure of the individual, because there are four types of humans on the planet, okay, we want to talk about the major four races, even though there's seven races on the planet right now, there are four basic genetic structures that I want to talk about. Truly, they all have different metabolisms, different diets, Different lifestyles are created for different activities and have a different relationship with the sun. So when the sun now becomes the main core energy source, the relationship with the sun and understanding when you have high time energy that you can draw upon to actually help you metabolize, help you think, help you get through a particular activity, and when you don't, is extremely important. 
A good example of that is truly in the melanin dominant race because melanin being an encapsulation of all of the known and unknown light spectrum truly resonates from the sun. So when we begin to utilize our bodies in a way that is antagonistic to allowing ourselves to ride with the energy that's on the planet at any particular time now becomes a problem. It is a known fact that for all organisms, because the sun is the sundial for what's happening in this dimension, that there's a time and a place for everything. Everything moves in a rest and a motion and a motion and a rest. So these are just basic understandings that one has to understand about themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. When, for example, that we eat, when we know that the energy on the planet is the lowest, there's no sun, there's no heat, et cetera, but we eat a meal that is extremely heavy, and then we ourselves don't, do not assist the body in allowing that food to be able to pass through the digestive tract, sit in a tremendous amount of stress on the body. I don't think many people really recognize, and there's a, a test that we do known as live cell, that when they eat this way, large particles of food actually pass through the wall of the digestive tract and go into the bloodstream. When that happens, that immediately kicks in the immune system to have to handle this foreign body. And on our TV set in our office, we are able to see undigested food having to be phagocytized by your white blood cells because if it is allowed to continue to just stay around in the bloodstream, uh, just a whole toxic reaction occurs so that if the little fibers or fingers that are on the walls of the digestive tract are not assisted in absorbing those nutrients and processing them, then when it goes through the wall of the digestive tract, your immune system now is consumed with having to eat the residue. Now that means then that if there's bacteria present, or there's other pathogens that are in the air, et cetera, they are not available to take care of more threatening activities because they gotta eat the residue from an indigested or undigested meal. So now therefore, when we start having symptoms of feeling just tired, lethargic, anything in the air and in the environment seems to bother you, many times we can also identify that these people have terrible eating habits and they do their largest eating at nighttime after the sun has gone down. That is a no-no. That will truly sap your life force energy very, very rapidly and really have you in a serious state of health, usually by the time you're in your late 50s or 60s. But by the time you look at the condition of your body, you've actually lost a lot of your youthfulness and resilience. The idea of not understanding that the concept of creating a self-defrosting refrigerator a, or an auto-cleansing oven, a self-cleansing oven, is no more than the human being that created it really creating themselves. Auto-cleansing or self-cleansing is a natural phenomena of the body. It is known as purification. And the purification process is where the body will increase its body temperature. It will automatically turn on its own heating system to liquefy toxins that have accumulated in the body. Once they are then turned into a liquid state, they are immediately removed into the lymphatics to be removed through the lungs, through the kidneys, okay, and out of the body. Now, modern science, however, wants to say that having a fever is pathologic and immediately you're supposed to stop the process. What happens then when you take the Tylenol or whatever else you want to take to actually turn off the liquefying agent, you immediately allow these solidified toxins to stay in the body longer, which eventually produce the cysts that we have, whether it's they told you that it was a lipoma, they told you that it was just a cyst here that was just right. Well, that is actually stagnated waste that was not allowed to go through the purification process to be eliminated from the body. When we again, once these toxins have been liquefied, do not then allow ourselves to eliminate them properly through the breath by proper breathing, proper exercising, allowing ourselves most of all to sweat. This is a real big problem. Then they begin to re-solidify, but you have to remember they've already been moved to the lungs. 
This is what has happened with most people when they're diagnosed to have pneumonia. Pneumonia is an interruption of a purification process that did not allow, the person did not allow this process to go into completion. So yes, we do breathe in bacteria in the air. And when we have this waste that does have sugar in it, it does have protein in it, et cetera, that is now sitting there in the lungs, this is real food that this bacteria that we've inhaled can live off of. So it appears as though that there is a viral or a bacterial pathogen that is the reason for the ammonia, uh, pneumonia. That is not true. The reason for the pneumonia is the fact that there was an elimination, a purification that attempted to take place and the individual by their unwillingness to pay attention to the symptoms of the body and first of all to rest it. It's like we know that when the refrigerator is defrosting, when the stove is self-cleaning, we don't try to bake on it. And we don't try to put food in the refrigerator to be refrigerated. Okay, we let the process go through the whole motion, let it clean itself up, and then we know now that we can put our food back in the refrigerator that we can now continue to cook on it. But now when these processes of a runny nose, the temperature goes up, et cetera, do we then immediately put ourselves in a resting position, trusting that the body knows what it's doing and has the capability of taking care of this process? No. We've got to go to work. We've got to do this. We've got to do that, et cetera. And as all of us know, the statistics state that every two minutes somebody is dying. But now, has that really changed the quality of your life? And has it really interfered with anything that you're choosing to do? No. Which means then that if people are dying every two minutes and we have an agenda for ourselves, that their moving off the planet does not change what it is that we want to do. There's something else, even if they were the bus driver, the cab driver, whatever else, there's somebody come along to still get you where you want to go or service you. So the idea that all of a sudden the world ends because you don't go to your job or, you know, life starts because you're not willing to honor yourself immediately puts you in the range of the individuals who also are going to be going to the graveyard. You're going to be one of these two people every two minutes that's going to be leaving here. Uh, excellent example is as we came out the office uh, yesterday, there was a taxi parked in front of the hotel and uh, the doorman just kind of says to us, well, yeah, this cab is here because the cab driver slumped over on the wheel and had a massive heart attack and died. So, you know, the ambulance was making noise behind us, but, you know, I didn't really pay much attention. But it was because they had just pulled the man off the steering wheel and threw him in the back of the truck, and he was on his way to the morgue. Now, there is no way that this gentleman did not know that he was having problems with his heart. The heart just never, ever stops like that. These people always have symptoms. Indigestion for long periods of time, heaviness on the chest, ringing in the ears, pain down the arm. He had all of these symptoms. I know that he did. But now his unwillingness to recognize that his body was giving him signs and symptoms that it needed to do nothing more than purify itself is now the fact that he'll never drive another taxi again. And of course, one hour later, somebody else came and got the taxi and they're driving on. So it's very interesting that now because people have lost the esteem of self, the value of how important you are, that there's a whole industry to help you even repress all these symptoms so you can get to the job. So when you turn the TV on, from the time you turn it on, they're telling you to take Dristan for this, something for this, something for that, and all of these symptoms that they're addressing are symptoms of purification and elimination of waste. So this is very, very dangerous when you recognize that there's a whole industry that now has been created to making sure that if you're not aware of the natural cleansing process that your body will go through, that you can actually pay to feel better on your way to the grave. You can actually, you'll be actually paying to feel better on your way to the grave. So when the aspirin stops the temperature, when the pain reliever stops the aching pain, et cetera, what is actually happening in your body? And it's very important for you to understand that your body is a gift. It is the greatest tool that has been given to you. It is not your enemy. It has no intentions of wanting to abandon you. It has no intentions of wanting to bring pain on you. But if 
like anything, you don't take time to learn how it functions, to learn what it does, what it should be doing, and how to care for it, how can you get the best out of it? It's like a person who has a wonderful automobile, but has not taken any time to learn what it needs for maintenance, how to get the best mileage out of it, et cetera. They find that it, they don't have a good rapport with it. And eventually, if they don't pay attention, it can definitely cause them to lose lots of money. And most of all, it can cause you to lose your life. An automobile was not built to do any of these things except to be able in comfort and in style to get you from point A to point B. But it is the rapport, the lack of rapport, that causes all this other stuff that people are experiencing. We have to stop putting it on the automobile, or we have to stop putting it on the drugs, blaming the drugs. So we, we have to take full responsibility that our unwillingness to have a value on understanding what our relationship is to ourselves and what it is that we expect to have as a quality of life is very, very, very important. You know, we have people that they eat some very interesting things. And, you know, we talk about the fact that you can be here indefinitely. Immortality is a reality. But now it's just common sense. You don't have to have, you know, any extensive IQ to recognize that you c cannot eat dead and denatured food and not have to finally use your own life force energy to metabolize it. The key is, is that at least you want to be putting things in your body that break even as far as energy goes or actually gives you more energy than you feel that you have at the moment. And we see many individuals that will eat things that by the time they're able to gnaw this stuff down, they are totally unconscious. Totally unconscious, which has automatically told them that what little energy they did have that allowed them to be able to get this into their mouth and chew it, it sapped all of that. That's all gone. You know, and, and we've all been victim of this because we didn't have this information. I mean, this is one of the things that really woke me up uh, about having to make some changes in my life that truly were not introduced to me because of my home environment. When I was doing my residency, uh, I had my OB um, stint, and uh, it was intense because I was on 36 hours off 12. And so those 36 hours, I had to be awake and able to respond to women in coming in labor, women coming in with symptoms in the emergency room, and having to deal with any problems that were on the postpartum wing. So I recognized that when I wasn't busy and I had time to get down to the hot lunch table before they closed, that when I could get my favorite piece of meat, which was beef, that the rest of my evening was over. And I would recognize on days when I got so busy that the hot lunch line was closed and all was available was just raw, fresh salads, you know, some jello, whatever else, et cetera. And I stopped eating jello a long time ago when I figured out why the cow's face was on the box. You know, I recognized that I had energy still to be able to get through the night. So, you know, I didn't feel full eating just a salad, but I recognized that I still had surplus energy that I could function. So I made sure that I really was able to finish up everything, and I just made sure I ran in at the very last end to get this piece of meat. They're, they used to have these beef on bun sandwiches, you know, these lots of this rubber, the rubbery beef on these big onion rolls. So, you know, I got this, and of course, and when you're a surgeon, you don't have time to do much anything, so you just kind of gnaw this stuff down real quick, and I went back up to the unit. So we didn't have anybody in labor, everything in postpartum was quiet, there was nobody in the emergency room. So I said, well, fine, you know, no telling what will break out tonight, so I'll take a nap. When I came to, it was two and a half hours later, and I, in my mind, had only been asleep about a half an hour. No problem, but when the nurses came in and said, oh, you know, we tried to wake you up on about three or four occasions to sign some orders off, and we just could not arouse you, that was very frightening because that meant then that if somebody had to came in bleeding, if somebody had to come in uh, ready to deliver, that I would not have been able to assist them. I would have been just totally incompetent to rise to the occasion. And I was very concerned about that, and I said, well, you know, do I have some kind of disease? What's going on? I mean, I can't fi finish this residency if I can't be able to be aroused at the proper time. And I had never done this before. So I went to the endocrinologist to find out if I had some kind of endocrine problem, was it my thyroid or whatever. So his thing was, well, you know, you could lose 10 pounds, but otherwise you're fine. 
Now, did that help me at all? No, because I recognized that I had a problem because I still did not have an answer for not being able to be coherent and be able to be aroused for two hours out of my life. And people are expecting me to be available to assist them. So I said, well, let me just pay attention to what was going on at the time that this happened. And it was very clear to me that, again, this did not happen to me when I did not eat beef. So I said, well, let me do the experience, the experiment, because I had never heard of meat causing these kind of problems. That had never been ever taught to me, never said in medical school or anything, but I'm just going by what my body was telling me. I said, okay, well, let me not eat any more beef and just see what happens. Lo and behold, it never happened again. So I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. I said, I won't tell this to anybody because they won't believe it, but I just will recognize that, hmm, I have an allergic reaction to beef, okay, because that's what we're just going to say this is. So then I start noticing that I start getting drowsy when I ate chicken. So I was like, oh, now that's real interesting because, you know, this sensation of wanting to just kind of sit down and be quiet and, and uh, uh, not feel like really wanting to think a lot was starting to occur with chicken. So I said, well, I think I better leave that alone. So I stopped eating chicken and that never came back again. So I would eat fish and I started having a craving for a lot of protein, so I started eating cheese. As a matter of fact, there was a wholesale house uh, in Detroit where you could get uh, pretty good quality cheeses very inexpensively. So I would buy five, seven, eight pounds of cheese and it would be gone in a week. So I was like, oh, that's, you know, and I loved it, no problem. Nobody ever told me that this stuff wasn't good for me. But, you know, I love shoes. So I looked down at my foot one day and I recognized I started getting this bulge at the base of my big toe. And I was like, oh no, there's just no way that I could just be getting a bunion. I cannot even understand that. So, you know, I just said, what is it that I'm doing that I did not normally do that would cause this phenomenon? See, I was just not willing to accept that this is just something that just happens and you just move on. Now, whether that was my vanity, I don't know, but I just was not going to accept the fact that my toe was supposed to turn inward on its own. <laughs> so, therefore, it came to me that, you know, I was eating all this cheese. I mean, you're eating five to seven pounds of cheese a week. So I said, well, you know, let me just not eat this anymore. I said, okay, we'll give this a little experiment. In two months' time after I stopped eating cheese, my foot straightened out. This lump went away. So I'm like, oh, like, this is real interesting. So I recognized that animal products, flesh, and their byproducts were something that I could not include in my diet. If I wanted to stay healthy, if I wanted to stay alert, and most of all, if I didn't want my body structure to actually change. So this was still my own personal experience. I didn't necessarily equate this to other people's. And I just kind of tell you this story to let you know that from my own experience, how I felt, what was happening to my body, I recognized that there was a direct correlation with the foods I was eating and the changes that were happening, into my, happening to my body, which were degenerative. Now, there are many, many things that can cause these same phenomena, but what is the underlying factor here? The underlying factor is that I was eating foods that had minimal energy in them that was causing my body to have to give up its energy where the normal natural phenomena keeping my body static was not able to occur anymore. It actually was putting me in a negative energy deficit. So obviously when we eat food that comes out of a can, when it's frozen, when it's day old, one day, two day, three days old food, it has no energy in it. It has no energy in it. And so when you eat that food, um, you will actually recognize that it will usurp your life force energy. These are really important basic laws that you have to remember if you want to talk about not aging and actually being here for long periods of time. The key is to be able to be appropriately aware of the accountability of how you're using your energy. It's, a, it's an equation. You have X amount of energy. You also have X amount of resources to draw energy on so that up, upon or from so that you don't have to use your own. And if you're not paying attention to what has energy, that by the time you eat it, you 
have been able to restore your energy from digesting it and absorb extra energy, then you're going to have problems. And it's really that simple. Now, what I find is so interesting is that the structure of the African race, because they are what I call sun dominant or have the capacity to absorb a tremendous amount of energy from the sun, that they can eat foods that have basic minimal nutrients and be able to use them completely and the amount of death that we have, the amount of deterioration and aging is totally in opposition to the innate capacity to be here indefinitely. But I also recognize that being in an unnatural environment, not understanding how to properly cope and adjust to an unnatural environment, that is that living above the 42nd degree latitude for Africans automatically cuts you off of a tremendous amount of sunlight and then not understanding the need to have to honor the fact that you come from an open air society. We need much, much more air. We cannot be in very closed type places like Caucasian races can because they've been conditioned to live in areas with high carbon monoxide for thousands of years. We cannot do that. So when the windows are not open, if everything is sealed down, when there's no light, et cetera, and most of all, when there's a lot of dust and debris around, it takes a tremendous toll upon us. So these are just basic things that one has to understand, and it's a necessity to expose ourselves to as much sunlight as possible. And these things have already been documented, so why aren't they taught to the children? It is because once one is that the parents obviously don't have the information, and two, the schools that our children go to are not geared to teach them from a perception of who they are as the norm. And that is a parental responsibility, is that it is very important that whoever you're teaching should be taught what they need to know to be the best they can be, not what is best for somebody else, but for them. So when we have teachers who are then also ignorant of who they are that actually look like the student, then we've got a serious problem here. Now, I just want to go back to this purification process because again, when this purification process could not complete itself, that this liquefied waste could not leave the body through the lungs, through the colon, through the lymphatics, it then now re-solidifies and will then relocate itself in the body. Now, why does it perhaps locate itself in the lungs or in the arm or in the leg or in the prostate or in the uterus, et cetera? Well, now, that's a very interesting phenomenon, and we have begun to understand that truly the location of disease, waste in the body, is due to the perception of the mindset of the individual and their emotional body. For example, prostate disease. Prostate disease is a reflection of women who have true issues around accepting their nurturing capacity. The uterus on the physical level is the innate resource for nurturing. It is the first house for an incoming soul, and it will take care of that soul for nine months until it is able to stand on its own, which is known as birth. The uterus and that capacity to nurture also has an emotional body, and it also has a mental body. And we notice that women who do not appreciate the nurturing capacity, whether it's on a physical level, have also emotional and mental inner issues around nurturing at all. We ask them about their relationships with their mates. They're strained or either totally void because of the inability to deal with differences in relationships that have allowed them to feel uh, less than loved and hurt. We find that there have definitely been issues to decide if they would even allow their uterus to be a incubator or a uh, nurturing chamber and have had usually one or more abortions. As a matter of fact, the uh, Afro-American women in this country supply the most placentas and the most fetuses for the cosmetic and research industries. There is definitely an issue around the African woman recognizing that her life force energy should be used for something that she truly believes is something that she should be doing. When we sit down and talk to these women with uterine fibroids, the jobs that they perform every day are jobs that if they were to really ideally be living their ideal life, they would never even think about performing. 
So the understanding is that whenever you're involved in something, exchanging your life force energy, that is a form of nurturing and sustaining. So for the woman, everything that she's involved in is a child, whether it's preparing a meal, whether it's writing a letter, whether it's making a garment, whether it's, you know, performing a job for someone else, all of these are actually her children. So therefore, when there are ambivalences about the proper use of this nurturing energy, whether it's with her children, with her mate, or on the job that she is, the thoughts that she has will actually now be attached to the physical internal representation of that part of the body that actually is the prototype for that type of activity. Does that make sense? So therefore, the physical uterus is the prototype for nurturing on whatever level. And when there's issues around the proper use of that energy, then now her reluctance to want to be accountable for the honest and direct use of that actually puts that organ under psychic attack. Therefore, the brain translates that ambivalence, that emotional mental conflict into a substance, and the uterus being sensitive to that is now having to deal with the collection of toxins that that creates. So we have identified that obviously having a hysterectomy is totally inappropriate, and these women go on to have a, a tremendous amount of other side effects from that because the disease, which is a mental emotional conflict, was never, cre was never treated. Taking Lupron, which is a, a drug that actually turns these women now completely into men. They totally can't nurture anything because nurturing of sorts is not actually a male characteristic, okay? Sustaining something is, but the actual art of creating to manifest is not a masculine trait. So now they totally become men. So we have a real issue here. They become, get secondary sideburns, hairs on their chin, the whole bit, lose their cycles, et cetera. That is not an appropriate treatment for this kind of disease. And only when we're able to help these women recognize that their unwillingness to accept their normal role as a female and what that really represents and to be actually able to be accountable for the use of their energies is when the tumors on their own resolve because they then allow the normal purification process to complete itself. So uterine fibroids is no more than an attempt of a purification that has been arrested by the resistance of a mind and an emotion, no body, to come into alignment. So when these women are willing to leave the job that they know they don't want to be on, when they're willing to recognize that obviously if you withhold, you have to be withheld from, so you can't expect someone to give you something that you're not willing to give, that is that you don't trust your mate, you don't trust the person you're involved in, then how can he completely submit to you? That's ridiculous. So, you know, we form all of these uh, uh, perceptions here on mis conceived information that basically causes us to produce these toxic states that cannot be totally eliminated from the body. The same thing with prostate. Prostate definitely deals with men who have issues around whether they are actually performing and functioning in the role as a man. So now we go to an esteem issue because whatever a woman is to you and whatever a man is to you truly is a chemical reality in the bloodstream. And if you say that, you know, your name being, you know, John Johnson, having male genitals is not a man because you have X, Y, and Z or you can't do A, B, C, D, you automatically then set up a psychic attack that chemically begins to attack those organs that would make you male. So obviously cutting out the prostate is not the answer because it makes you uh, impotent. It definitely diminishes the sperm count not because the testicles are not making sperm, but the sperm can no longer be directly deposited in the woman's vagina because now they get distributed into the bladder. That's what happens. When that happens now, it also makes you prone for autoimmune diseases because the sperm and your bloodstream have never met. So in the bladder, when the sperm now has access to the bladder, because normally it does not, when the capsule of the prostate has not been uh, interrupted, the bloodstream is like, oh my goodness, well, what is this? We've never seen this before. We have no idea what it got to be in a foreign invader. So now the immune system becomes activated 
and little missiles, which we call antibodies now, are made against these sperm. And wherever they're coming from, the missiles are activated to destroy that area. So then we see these men begin to have all kind of funny problems go on, et cetera, because of the fact that they had misperceptions of who they are and how they should function, which is something that needs to be purified and clarified within the communication between their emotional and mental self, not to be repressed with the drug. They give you estrogen for this, not to have it cut out, you know, but to actually deal with the mental emotional conflict. But now I think this gets very interesting because when individuals are not recognizing that it is the mind and the emotions that determine the contour, the shape, the actual action of the physical body, they think that they can really start playing games and that they don't have to actually speak about what they're feeling and thinking and nobody will know. Now this has been one of the greatest charades that I've seen this century is that whatever you are thinking and whatever you feel is determined and exhibited by your physical body. So when you are excess in emotional ways, oh yeah, you're gonna be overweight, there's no way. These are totally, truly emotion, emotionally burdened individuals. And there's no way that you can tell me that you're not sensitive and that you are definitely not carrying a, a lot of emotional stuff because that is what fat actually represents. Okay, individuals who have these huge big chests, that's all they do is go lift weights every day, et cetera. These are very insecure, inadequate individuals that use this as a means of shielding their emotions. So when you see a person walking around the street like that, you know that they definitely have deep-seated inadequacies. And this is a means of them attempting to compensate. So it's like, okay, this is real interesting. You can't hide your emotions and what you are thinking. And it's only because of people don't know how to read their own physical body or other people's physical body that they basically get snap food, I guess, and you know, letting these people tell them something totally different when the evidence is right there in front of their face. So, you know, just sitting down and having a conversation with these individuals will let you know that, you know, their uh, inadequacies or their misperceptions or their low self-esteem. I mean, this all comes out. So you can see anger on people's face. There's no way that you can tell me that you're not angry and you can barely open your mouth because your teeth are so gritted to say hi. And I'm supposed to believe that you're not angry. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So it's like, there's no such thing as a secret. So the idea that you feel that you cannot talk about these things that are bothering you, you're saying them anyway. They come out through your physical body. But unfortunately, the way that they come out, it disfigures, it distorts, and it destroys. So by the time you get to the grave, we knew all your issues. <laughs> That's the point. We knew all your issues. You cannot hide. There's no such thing as secrets. You know, and sometimes I have people come in and it's like, well, you know, you're talking so loud. I don't want anybody to hear whatever. And it's like, oh, that's real interesting. It's like, have you looked in the mirror lately? Okay, it has nothing to do with the tone of my voice. It's like everybody who looked at you knew something was wrong already. You didn't, you know, it's, I mean, there's no such thing as a secret. So this exclusivity or this idea that we think our stuff is so secretive that we can't talk about it, it is really a joke and millions of people are dying every day thinking that they're keeping secrets. I mean, just to show you something that's very interesting. You can look at a woman's pelvis, you can look at the contour of her thighs and her legs, and you can know right away if she's been sexually molested in childhood or early adolescence. You can just look at her pelvis. I mean, these women that have tremendously knocked knees, their thighs rubbed together, et cetera, they have been sexually molested. And the psychological trauma of that has totally shifted the pelvis and the fat distribution to actually make a barrier to get to the perineum, the vagina. That is not how you're normally built. This is because of sexual molestation. And I'm telling you that when these women are willing to open up, they all give you the history that they have. They just, for whatever reason, felt that they could not, but their bodies told it. So I'm just saying that we just have to stop playing the games and recognize the greatest gift that we have is this physical body, but it talks. It communicates all the time, and when you take the time to really be sophisticated about what your body 
is exhibiting to you, you can always recognize that it really originated from the mind and from the spirit. What is happening with cancer? Well, having had cancer, which was a wonderful initiation for me, it is the scourge for the liar. Now, my grandmother used to always talk about if you lie, you'll steal. I just never even understood what she was talking about. But I do understand this, that you do rob yourself of a high quality life not being willing to be honest with yourself emotionally and mentally. And I have never, never sat with a cancer patient who was not living a lie. The job they worked on, the relationships they were in, the relationships with their kids, it was just, it's all contrived. But their low self-esteem and their need to be recognized and accepted by whatever they think out there is going to make them a better person is what they get up and strive to actualize every day knowing that they hate it. So they continuously do this that creates this toxic bloodstream that then causes these toxins to solidify in the body because they interfere again with the purification reaction and they're out of here. So when these individuals are finally recognizing the fact that, you know, it's a choice between going to the grave, being a slave to something or someone else, or finally beginning to allow yourself to be the real you and let everybody else know what that is, those are the ones that are able to recover and never have any problems. But it is truly a choice that they have made for many, many years to stay in relationships, to stay on jobs, to have relationship with children or spouses or whatever, that they know that if they had been in their right mind or living their ideal self, they wouldn't even think about doing. And they think that every day anyway, but they still lie and keep up the front. So you cannot have this disfiguration and think that it is not a reflection truly of what's going on with you emotionally and mentally. I just want to say one last thing about esteem, okay? And I uh, did some little research on that and just looked it up. And esteem is actually a value. It is an estimate of something. And when we talk about self-esteem, we're actually talking about a value. When we look at what the definition of self is, we, it, it talks about interest. And I thought that it was really interesting that when I looked up the word interest, to have interest in something requires you to have a feeling about it. So self-interest means that you have to have a feeling about yourself, one that allows you to give yourself a value, which is an esteem. So when we define ourselves as something that when we think about our name or when we look ourselves in the mirror, that we automatically go into a discomforting feeling, it is the foundation for addiction. Now you want to know why people are addicts? That is why. It is because when they think about themselves based on the definition, the value, the esteem that they have assigned themselves, they automatically go into pain and to get out of the pain, they use a substance or an activity. Now, see, so you have to understand how much low self-esteem there is on the planet. So it has nothing to do with whether you're driving a big car or you wear a $100,000 suit, if there's such a thing. It has something to do with the fact that when you look in the mirror or you recite your name to yourself, you automatically go into pain because the value of what you think you are does not make you comfortable. Now, this is all self-inflicted. It has nothing to do with nothing outside of you. So if you decide that being a black man in America is a horrible thing, then obviously every day you wake up, you've got to do something about the pain. Oh, but this is real serious. You've got to do something about the pain. So therefore, when I wake up and recognize that my name is Joe Blow and I'm a black man in America and I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't have the other, then it's like, yes, where's the pipe? Where's the marijuana, et cetera, and we'll sit this day out. That's exactly what's happening all over this country. It is because the perception of these individuals is such that they create their own emotional pain and they want out. So now the treatment is not obviously gathering up all the pipes and getting rid of all the cocaine and marijuana because the people are still in pain because they still are perceiving themselves in less than an ideal way that creates a discomfort in the emotional body. So the treatment has to be to ask these individuals to redefine themselves and give themselves a different value system. It's real simple. So why would a person think that being a black man in America is a problem? Now, I mean, we just should just literally dissect that. 
Why would that be a problem? Do you know anybody cranking out black men in a meal? Of course not, because it is a divine state of existence. Only the creator makes those, which means then that if that's where it comes from, it has the characteristics and attributes of the source, which means that being a black man in America means that you are a divine entity. Now, understanding what that means now goes into your own value of what the creator would be. Because if that means that now you have dominion over the planet, that you have the capacity to do anything that you so put your mind to, et cetera, now that puts you into a whole different reflection of self. So you don't have to sit up and beg anybody and tell them that you need uh, uh, certain uh, gratuities or, you know, um, I think, I, don't, uh, I can't think of the name of this stuff that they use for uh, going to college and all this other stuff. You don't need these crutches. Because when you understand that you're a manifestation of the creator, you can learn anything you want to and any time you want to and apply it. So you don't have to apologize for this. <laughs> Being a black woman, I mean, this is the same issue. You know, well, I'm a black woman, so that means da 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 well, obviously, when she overeats or when she's actually smoking uh, drugs herself or marijuana or she's basically a workaholic because she thinks that working 24 hours is going to make her a better person or she's got to play the lotto every day or whatever else this is. All of this is because her esteem of self is less than what the body and the emotional body knows that it should be. So taking away the lotto, you know, firing her off her job, whatever else the situation, none of that treats the problem. It is the fact that she has to redefine who she is, change her name, or give herself a broader definition of self and be able to actualize that. But the idea that something divine now having to be apologized for that's inadequate is totally a problem. And you have to understand the, the women in my race family maintain an industry, $18 billion a year in straightening their hair. Now, see, you have to understand that is a real problem because, first of all, it totally takes her out of her elements that she needs to be able to be here on the planet. You can't stay in the sun. You can't be in the rain. You can't be in the wind. You need sun and water and wind. So what do we have here? We have an addiction. That is an addictive process. So if you wanted to equate the crack pushers and the hair salons on the block, they were probably of the same number. And we have to deal with that. Now, there's no Koreans, anybody else, or whoever's making this synthetic hair, that definitely is like what the creator has given you. So the key is, is that there is a self-imposed low esteem that causes these individuals to go through this discomfort on a regular basis. It's discomforting. You should see what they go through in these some hair salons to get that stuff done. It's discomforting. And there's no need to lie about it. And as like I said, it's unnatural. You cannot be your natural self and sustain it. So therefore, it's like that automatically takes you out into a different element. And I learned that a long time ago, and I just really had to let that go. So I had to redefine myself. I had to move into a different awareness of what I meant to myself and why that was not going to be an issue in my life because I felt that if I could not face myself as how I was created, it was a personal problem that really meant that there was always going to be a block between me and whatever I tried to relate to. So now we have the same issue with our relationship with our children. It's not a sincere one because we don't even come to them being ourselves. We have this problem with the relationships with our men because we don't come to them being ourselves. I have some women that tell me that their husband ain't never seen their real hair. I mean, you know, so I mean, that's incredible. So I mean, what is he really loving? I mean, what is he really with? You know, that this, this kind of limitation or esteem of self is extremely dangerous. And when a person withholds from themselves to that extent, how are they going to really give you their best? They lie every time they say they love you. They, how can they when they don't love themselves? And we need to stop really playing these games. This is what causes the diseases that we have. And we cannot look to anybody but ourselves to treat them. So, you know, as I see these huge institutions propping up here, talking about they're the hospitals and they can give you a new arm and somebody's liver and somebody's leg and whatever else, et cetera. 
it is totally unnecessary because you can regenerate any part of your body. And the proper thing to do is give you the information so you can access that part of your brain so that it can regenerate. But the idea that you're going to go in the garbage can and get somebody's dead body in the grave and put that inside yourself, totally no esteem. A lizard won't even do that. They recognize they can crawl off and get a new leg and a new tail. They don't need to get, go to the lizard graveyard, if there's such a thing, and get somebody else's. So here you are with a huge brain that has the capacity to put airplanes in the sky, space stations, and you're going to crawl off and get a dead carcass and put it in your body. There is a real problem, and nobody should be able to sell you any madness like that. They're going around here collecting blood, and I'm like, for what? Everybody makes their own every day. Every day. Why are you collecting blood? And it's amazing that people lay there and give there to be given to somebody else, and it's like, well, don't they look like you? Yeah, if you stick them with a pen, they have little red blood that comes out. Just Right, because they make their own. So now, why is it that these people can't make their own? And they can I, at least that's what I learned from the Jehovah Witnesses. I've seen some of them in really bad shape, but they've been willing at least not take blood, and they live. Now, you know, of course, we're taught to harass them and do all kind of things to them in the hospital, that kind of thing, but it's been amazing. I've learned a lot of interesting things from my patients. They're my, my greatest teachers. I have patients that walk around and go to work every day with hemoglobin of two. Now, my thing is that why do you want to walk around with hemoglobin of two? Because that, no, it is not natural. And if you can get enough strength and energy to go to work every day and work eight hours with a drop of blood in your body, why can't you just get to the real issue and allow your body to make all the blood you need? Because it's still a level of withholding. So it's like, you know, why walk around on one leg when you can have two? If you get to the real issue as to why you lost the first one in the first place, now we can get us another one. Do you begin to understand what I'm saying is that this esteem issue, this lack of limitation of understanding who we are and what gifts we have are the reason for our suffering and there's no institution outside of you that is going to be the answer to rid these problems. No, no, no. So it's no need to invest your energies in that when you already come here completely capable of being here indefinitely and totally being capable of being total master and mistress of this entire planet. But that requires a state of consciousness. That's the only thing that separates the weak from the strong. It's consciousness. It is consciousness because truly I've seen people who've had half of a body be able to have much more transportation, be able to go and do more places than folks with a whole grown body. Now see, that's incredible because when you have a mind and an emotional body that's working, you can get anything done in this dimension. And I have seen people who have no arms and no legs who do all kind of awesome things, and we have folk, people completely developed sitting up looking crazy. <laughs> so what's the difference? It is your mindset. So it is very important to ask yourself why you think the way you think about yourself. Why do you not know how you feel about something? What have you been doing all this time that you aren't even aware about how you feel? Why don't you want to feel? Why are you overeating? Why are you taking drugs? Why are you working 18 hours a day instead of being at home? You know, these are the things you have to, because these are activities to keep you from really being in communication with yourself. That creates the toxin. That persistence in the same old behavior inhibits the purification process. And then, yes, somebody has to cut it out of you or cut it off or poison it out of you. And this is why you have these diseases. So again, the cause originates from within, mental, emotional, conflict, lack of compatibility, lack of communication with self, and most of all, an unwillingness to assign yourself the proper esteem value. That's very, very important. So the name you call yourself, you have to be very clear about what that means, and if it doesn't contain all the definitions that should be under it, you need to get busy then augmenting it, or either get a new name. But the idea that you're gonna settle for less is a no-no, because you cannot have a healthy body and do that. Thank you.